What's the word, y'all? Tonight we have big series saving wins from the Cavaliers and from the Phoenix Suns. And no, I'm not saying that they're gonna eventually win these series, but like you definitely don't want to lose the first two games of, this, of a series when you have home court advantage. So this game evens the playing field at least a little bit, but not not exactly because they still technically lost home court advantage by losing game ones. Regardless, both of those teams showed some really good things going forward. And I guess the Boston Celtics played a game today. It was on NBA TV. And I watched the first 15 minutes, and then the game that I care about came on. You know what I'm saying? The Boston Celtics playoff, for me, doesn't start until the next round. They're going to beat up on Atlanta. We all know that. It's going to be a four. Is it going to be a five? It's one or the other. At least that's what it feels like. So they don't, get a lot of, they don't get a lot of watch time, especially when the Knicks versus Cavaliers game was starting shortly after. Because I was seeing in my comment section over the last couple of videos, man, Kenny ain't talking about us. Talk, this is Celtics fans. And the same thing for the Denver Nuggets fans. Y'all series, y'all playoffs ain't started just yet. Now, if Anthony Edwards dropped 50 and they still a game in Denver, then we can have a conversation. But based on what I saw <laughs> in the first game between Denver and Minnesota, it's going to take a lot to steal a game there. And based on what I've seen from the Boston-Atlanta series so far, you know what I'm saying. So, so, so we'll talk about y'all later down the line. Just be chill. Again, big wins from the Cleveland Cavaliers and from the Phoenix Suns. I'm recording this video right after the Suns and Clippers game has ended. So if storylines develop overnight, that's why we didn't talk about them in this video. A game like this... It's one of the reasons why I picked the Phoenix Suns to win the Western Conference. And it wasn't the perfect game. It was highly flawed. And we're going to talk about some of those flaws because some of the flaws from game one came over to game two. But they were just so dominant in the mid-range area with three of the greatest mid-range scores of all time. I think the actual stat was they were 21 of 27 in the mid-range area. How do you stop it? And then we get a Vincent-type fourth quarter from Chris Paul to put the put the cherry on top. And again, it wasn't perfect, right? They only made 10 total threes and five of those came from the hands of Torrey Craig. I do not expect Torrey Craig to consistently hit five three-pointers in the game. Also, they basically got no bench production, which was the story in game one. So it was a flawed win, but it, it did showcase how good things can be. And on the other side of things, I'm watching this game and looking at how ridiculous Kawhi is on both sides of the ball and seeing a really good Russell Westbrook game. Ladies and gentlemen, we talked about him game one being a hero. He shot three of 19. Today, he shot 56% from the field. He made two of his three threes, and he was eight for eight from the free throw line. This is a very good Russell Westbrook game. But between Kawhi and Russell Westbrook, that was the only production they got. Everybody else on the team was awful shooting the ball. And I mentioned how the Phoenix Suns only made 10 threes. That didn't matter today because... A, a team that normally makes a ton and attempts a ton, and the Clippers only made 11. 0 for 4 for Bones Highland, 0 for 3 for Norman Powell, 0 for 4 for Nicholas Batum. Like, those are guys that usually hit a, hit a couple here now. Breaking it down a little bit more, again, this man Kawhi Leonard all season long, at least, okay, let's cut out maybe the first month of the year where he's coming back from that big injury. He has been so very dominant, and, and he has been a player that historically throughout his career has upped it in the playoffs. Me and the guys on the podcast are trying to figure out the players that should have playoff next to their name. You know what I'm saying? Like like playoff Jimmy, for the, for the most part, again, he does have the series where he got swept by the Milwaukee Bucks where he was stupidly locked in. But for the most part, playoff Jimmy has been a real thing more often than not. Playoff Kawhi has been a real thing. We also got like playoff Rondo from back in the day, even though Rondo himself said, there's no such thing as playoff Rondo. It was, at least that's what it felt like. The Bulls were up 2-0, on as the lower seed before he broke his hands when Rondo was here. I ain't forgot about a Rondo. Um, and playoff Kawhi is a real thing on both sides of the ball, man. Uh, in this game, it started off with Russell Westbrook on Kevin Durant, but eventually evolved to have Kawhi Leonard as the guy on Kevin. And again, Kevin had a really good game uh, throughout the course of it. But like in those possessions where it was 101 between Kevin Durant and Kawhi, it's like, I don't know, perfect for an NBA fan that's neutral here. We got one of the greatest offensive individual firepower players and Kevin Durant being guarded by one of the best perimeter defenders ever. And now Kawhi Leonard's not the same perimeter defender that he was five years ago, but he's still very, very good. So to see a lot of possessions like that was really cool, but the Clippers just needed somebody else to step out, up outside of him and outside of Russell Westbrook, and they did not get that. Where in game one, you saw other people step up and become factors, and today just wasn't the day. That book game was nasty though, man. I enjoy a good Devin Booker game, especially because Devin Booker has evolved to the point over the last couple seasons where he is not just all offense. I mean, I mean, I guess you can make an argument that he never has been just all offense, but he played for teams that won 19 games, so nobody really cared about the defensive side of the ball. But since they have been a contending type team, Booker has up upped his 
intensity on the defensive side of the ball. So not only did he give you 38 points, he also gave you a lot of possessions where he's locked in on the defensive side of the ball. And then again, having a vintage moment from Chris Paul where he breaks the curse. The Scott Foster curse is no longer. And then for him to have, what, eight points in the fourth quarter, shooting a 50 per 57% from the field. And it was just, it was the almost a perfect storm for them. And DeAndre Aiden had less points in this game than in his last. But I felt like this was a more dominant performance from DeAndre Aiden. Again, I didn't expect him to be booming on people or using that physicality that we know he could. But instead, it's like a little jump shot here, 16 footer here, here, here. And he killed the glass. And my major criticism for DeAndre Aiden after game one, where there's no way Chris Paul and and the and, uh, Kevin Durant should have more rebounds than you on a normal basis. Especially when your opposing team is killing the offensive glass. And they did get out offensive boarded again, but it was less of an impact today as those other days. Again, I say series saving, but that doesn't mean that I think that the Clippers are done. Like, it's very, very far away from that. I'm just saying that. Uh, you don't want to go down no two and then go on the road for two more games. So it's, it's series saving in that sense. But by no means does this mean that the Clippers are dead in the water because uh, people that normally hit shots did not hit shots today. Move on to the Cavaliers Knicks where the Cavaliers finally show the world why they were the number one defense in basketball this season. Um, game one, I saw a lot of jitters from Evan Mobley, from Darius Garland, who was missing bunny after bunny, both of them. Uh, Evan Mobley missed seven layups, it felt like, and they all were the exact same. And then Darius Garland had one possession in particular that I, I remember is where he uh, got to the mid-range area, took a mid-range shot, missed it. They got an offensive board to kick it out to him for the exact same shot. He missed it again. And I'm like, ah, normal Darius Garland's making one of those two. And in this game... DG to PG was locked in, um, and, and it was a it was a show. And Evan Mobley started off this game. I think he started off this game like 0 for three, 0 for four, but eventually started making those shots. And I'm like, this is the this is the version of the Cavaliers I expected from Game One. We didn't get it, but they got production in places where they didn't get a lot of production from before. Um, Isaac Coro played two minutes, got in early foul trouble. People are saying that he's also dealing with an injury, whatever. Danny Green got PT. The last week of the season, there was a game where Danny Green scored 20 points or whatever. And I made a video, like a little video on Twitter, like, this is why the last week of the season is hard to watch for me sometimes. Because a guy like Danny Green that was getting a ton of DMP coach decisions just get thrown into the fire and he gives you 20. He was thrown into the fire again and he had one shot. Um, <laughs> he had one shot. But he played 20 minutes. And I was low-key impressed a little bit with his mobility. It felt like the games that I have seen of Danny Green since that injury in the playoffs a few years ago, where his mo mobility was at an all-time low, and you kind of question, man, is this it for Danny? Um, and it was a little bit better today. And, and they kind of needed that if Ice is going through some injuries. I said it after game number one that I did not want to see Ricky Rubio and Dean Wade play minutes. They did it. Now, I said it, they're not bad players, but for a matchup like this, they just don't fit with guarding the New York Knicks or with scoring on the New York Knicks. And they both got zero minutes play, even in the garbage time where Robin Lopez gave us two post hooks. We did not see no Rubio. We did not see no Dean Wade. But it must feel really good for Cavs fans right now to have a game where Donovan Mitchell didn't need to drop 30 plus for them to have a chance. He has seven, uh, an efficient 17 points, 13 assists game for Donovan Mitchell. He was relying on these other dudes to do his thing. And Karis LeVert off the bench, this was one of his better games recently, and it came in the playoff series. So uh, this, this was a really good one. I, I know a lot of the conversation about this game is about Julius Randle and why he was in the game for the last two minutes. And then Reggie, Reggie Miller on the call. Had to bring up Derrick Rose. And they, they showed Derrick Rose. And his, Derrick Rose's dreads are like down here. I ain't realized his hair was that long now. Uh, and, you know, flashbacks to the, the the series against the 76ers where Derrick Rose is in the game when he probably shouldn't be in the game. And boom, he tears his ACL. And uh, Julius Randle's in the game that's far gone. And he gets hit pretty hard. And he's under the stanchion. And he's grabbing onto it. He has so much pain. He's grabbing the, the leg of a fan. And the fan, the fan, like, is this is this cool? Like, what's going on? Uh, and I hope Julius Randle's okay again. I ain't heard nothing else about it. Uh, Thibodeau was asked about it, and he said that he was going to pull Julius Randle, but Randle asked to stay in a little bit more to get more rhythm because this was a rough watch. It was a rough game for Julius Randle. It, it was very reminiscent of the playoff run a few years ago um, where he didn't have a good one. Um, and again, he's coming off such an injury, you know, thrown into the fire, so it's kind of expected that he won't be the all NBA version of himself. But again, this was a, this was a definitely a rough. Can you be disappointed in the player that you that you 
didn't have much belief in before. You know what I'm saying? Like usually you're disappointed by somebody you believe was gonna do something. RJ Barrett ain't done a thing in this series. Talk to me about defense, whatever. He ain't done a thing in this series. And that's scary. Um, pay, paid him a lot of money. And for him to be the third option, when his when it's first two dudes have stinker of a games, you want him to step up his play. 30% from, from the field. And again, throughout the course of the season after the Josh Hart trade, we had a ton of games this season where RJ wasn't closing out because uh, it, Josh Hart was the better option or Emmanuel Quickly was the better option. Like Tom Thibodeau's not afraid to do that, even if we paying you $40 million or whatever it is. Um, but it's been, it's been a rough two games. And for his sake and for New York's sake, if they want to win this series, I think you need some form of production. I ain't saying he got to be all NBA. He ain't got to be even be all-star. But you need some type of production. Because I saw 33 minutes of, of straight cardio and bricks. And that's just not going to cut it. Lastly, let's talk about the Draymond Green uh, suspension. Um, yesterday, Draymond Green uh, got ejected from a game where um, Demont Sabonis grabbed his leg. And in retaliation, he stumped on the sternum. And now we got Demont Sabonis being questionable for game three. Let's, Demont Sabonis is going to play. The man has been playing with a broken hand all season long. I think a sternum bruise is not going to hold him out of game three of the playoffs, a crucial game three of the playoffs. But Draymond Green got suspended. Um, and that was after earlier today, Shams and them had said, hey, the likelihood of him getting suspended is pretty low. He was like, oh, okay, cool. That's how, That was my reaction. Okay, cool. Draymond Green to be there for the first game of the Chase Center. Cool. That's all That's all dandy. And then late tonight, they was like, nope, he's going to he's gonna get a game. And I just want to clear up some things here. Because some things are not not adding up. You know, on social media, you know, the, the ejection or the suspension comes out. And, you know, I'm refreshing to see what people are thinking. And I saw a, a tweet with a decent amount of interactions and, and comments and likes and stuff. Basically assuming that the, that the NBA is rigging it for the Warriors to lose. And it blew my mind. That that's who we at right now, y'all. That y'all think that's a, that's facts. Think, think about the landscape of the NBA right now, y'all. The NBA could potentially have a Steph Curry versus LeBron James series in the second round. And you think they, they rigging it to prevent that? You think the NBA is making more money on the Kings advancing? I don't believe so, man. This is not a rigging. You can say you disagree with the suspension. It's fine. But if you, it's not because they want to see the Kings advance because it's more profitable for their business to see the Warriors advance to see the Lakers potentially. Again, I ain't, I ain't writing the, the Memphis Grizzlies off. But like with a John Moran injury, it's more likely that the Lakers are going to advance. So they could potentially see two of the greatest of all time, arguably two top 10 players in the history of basketball, see each other in the second round. You think the NBA is like, nah, we don't want that. They're trying to set a precedent across the league. There are things that you can do and things that you can't do. And Draymond Green apparently crossed the line. Agree or disagree, it's not because the NBA thinks that Sacramento is more profitable or they want to see that. The story of Sacramento making the playoffs in the first place is profitable for the NBA, but watching the Warriors advance in the second round is way more profitable than that. Can, can we agree on that? Cool. This was not a rigging. You can disagree with the suspension, but it's not because they want the Kings to advance. All right? Cool. I do want to say on the record that I do not like the idea of Draymond Green getting suspended for game three. I just don't think it's some overarching conspiracy that's anti-warrior. Um, as a dude that just wants to see the best basketball being played, Draymond Green helps the best basketball getting played. So it does suck a little bit for the series because it feels the, like that without Draymond, you know, it's going to be a lot tougher in game three to pull out there with that victory. So um, I, I, I don't know. I just wanted to make it clear that I didn't agree with the suspension, but I don't think it's some type of conspiracy. All right. See you tomorrow.